it's MasterChef, and the semi-finals continue. Last time. The noise is unbelievable, isn't it? After reaching new heights. Let's go, 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 go. Come on. Let's keep pushing, guys, yeah? Fantastic. 21-year-old Robert went home. Now only the strongest seven remain, and tonight they'll have to take their cooking to a whole new level. Today's about being brave, being bold, pushing the boundaries. Let's freak him out a bit. That fish, that fish keeps looking at me. Whoa! <laughs> Hoping that I've done enough. Whoa! Yeah. Look at that! There's no room for mistakes, because one more amateur will be leaving the competition. Welcome back, all seven of you. We've pushed you hard, we know that, but that's what it takes in order to find a MasterChef winner. Today, we have an invention test for you, with a difference. Would you please now have a look at your ingredients? <laughs> what you have in front of you are scraps and leftovers. Things that maybe as a cook, you usually throw away. In my opinion, what you've got are little pots of gold. Some of you look like you're in your element. Some of you look terrified. One hour and 15 minutes, one extraordinary dish. At the end of this, one of you is going home. Let's cook. I've got a rat's tail in mine. Are you joking? Oh, nice pigtail. The scraps consist of meat trimmings, including offal, pig's tails and ears, a fish bowl, and fruit and vegetable trimmings. It's really overwhelming. I just can't think of anything. That's freaking me out a bit. That fish, that fish keeps looking at me. Um, yeah, fear. It's a bit of fear going on. I'm not the best with meat and at the best of times, let alone ears and tails and things, so very cautiously putting my hand into that bucket. Um. Tony has proved himself to be a great cook in this competition and a really good team player, but come to invention, I tell you what, Tony sometimes suffers a little bit. I hate invention tests. I'm rubbish at them. Um, my last one went awfully for Monica. So, yeah, I'm terrified. Tony, how have you found the semi-final? It's been great fun. Uh, I've learned a lot, which is good. But the calibre of these guys is insane, so I'm having to try and keep up with them. And uh, hopefully today I'll be able to do that. Sarah continues to impress me because the food that she makes puts a smile on my face. It's not necessarily technically challenging, but it's really good. Your face, when you had a look at the ingredients, was an absolute picture, yeah. a picture of terror. Yeah, I don't eat a lot of meat. Like, it's something that I'm doing a bit more now because of the competition, so to open that up and to see a pig's ear, wax still in, <laughs> was quite something. Head down. Yep. Come on. I am getting more confident and I'm getting braver. I think that's the most important thing. I'm trying things that I couldn't have dreamed of cooking, you know, a few weeks ago. So the rate of acceleration and progression in this competition is just crazy. Simon has produced some really beautiful plates in this competition. He had a brilliant round at the, the Red Arrows. He was absolutely outstanding. He needs to bring all that experience into here today. We had a, a really good day at, at the RAF. So far, so good. If it, if it stays as good as that, I'll be a happy chap. 
You have cooked some amazing dishes in this competition and you look just as nervous now as you did when I first met you. What goes on in You just want to do well. It's the, the pressure of performing, I suppose, really. And I've done all right so far, so fingers crossed. Beth is a great cook. She's delivered some great flavours so far. She's made mistakes, but she fights for her place. Who knows? She may fight all her way to the final three. You do get a little bit more confident the further on you go, because I just feel like I wouldn't be here if I didn't deserve it. But that doesn't really mean that I'm not nervous and terrified. I'm just trying to handle it better. Are you enjoying yourself? Really enjoying it, yeah. I don't want it to end, to be honest. You want to stay here in the competition with us? Yeah, or I'll just, I don't know, I'll do the catering or something, I don't know, even if I'm out. <laughs> You seven are halfway. You are halfway. Uh, yeah, I'll get there, but, but only just. It's going to be tough. What are you making, mate? Sort of a, a salad with crispy gizzards, a grilled chicken's heart, and a deep fried chicken wing. It wouldn't be you, would it, with your graphics background without designing the look of it? Oh, wow. Um, it's going to be sort of a bit off the cuff at the end, I think. But, uh, really? A last minute affair. You're not telling me you've actually designed a dish with <laughs> flavour in mind first. <laughs> yeah, I have. Yeah, <laughs> amazingly. Pete loves Asian food. He's getting better at it. His food is becoming more refined. He doesn't have all the gimmicks. Now it's becoming real food. <laughs> you've got 30 minutes left. All right, half an hour left. I am just about on track. I'm just warming my bone marrow. Paul's food sometimes has the odd mistake, like Partridge with his palate test. But we forgive those mistakes because his food always tastes really good. There's always something that's not quite right with one of my dishes. And I'd love to put up something with which they can't find any fault. This is a test and a half, Paul, isn't it? It's a great test. Um, but I use up leftovers at home all the time. You are a thrifty cook. I am a thrifty cook. And your passion for the competition, Paul? Because you, you... It hasn't dimmed in the slightest. Yeah! Some of the most delicious food I've eaten in this competition has been cooked by Emma. She has stirred my emotion. I like that in the cook. Today, I need to be on form. I really, really don't want this to be my last day. I really don't. I am desperate to get to the end, and I'm going to do everything I can to get there. Listen, you, you've, you've worked really hard in these semi-finals. I mean, Thank really you. hard. Yeah. H how's it been for you? Do you know what? I have never pushed myself so hard in all my life, but I'm, I'm actually really enjoying it as well. I mean, I think the last round was, was terrifying for me. I really felt it. And I've given myself a good kick and said, you know, come on, you can do this. You deserve to be here. Final seven. I'm um, all guns blazing. Emma, head down. Yeah. Focus. Nice yep. to see you smiling. Thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Eight minutes, please. Eight minutes. <sighs> Not a scrap more time. I'm hoping it'll all come together. But um, I seem to have run out of time really quickly on this one. My pasta's just gone in, livers are about to go in. I need to finish off my sauce and I need to plate up. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be close. Hoping that I've done enough, you know. It is, at the end of the day, a salad, so... Uh, fingers crossed. Two minutes left. <laughs> That's it! Stop! <sighs> that was hard. What's what flavour is your sauce? Um, it's a gazpacho. Oh, right, cool, yeah. Like a scratcho dressing. Oh, that a fancy Look pan. Look at that. Oh, wow. What are they? Is that those, the hearts? Um, they're the uh, liver. Beautiful. Oh, wow. It looks amazing. Mine's so untechnical compared to everyone else's. I'm gone today. I don't know. I think it could be any of it. First up is Pete, 
who's used the chicken trimmings to make a salad of crispy chicken gizzard, confit chicken wing and chicken hearts with pickled cucumber, broccoli puree and a ginger, soy and garlic dressing. That's a lovely looking dish. Well done. Deep fried gizzards don't work. Okay. They don't, they're too tough. Yeah. As for the rest of it, incredible. I'm really impressed, Pete, because you've got a lovely, sharp, sour sauce sitting underneath it. You've got the smokiness of the broccoli puree, lovely flavoured chicken. Pete, from a bowl of scraps, I can't ask for much more. Good looking dish, good tasting dish. The gizzard's a mistake. Yeah. Apart from that, everything else is absolutely lovely. That's a relief, I was worried about it. Sarah has made paella balls with leftover rice and bone marrow and is serving them with braised beef, griddled squash and aubergine and a gazpacho dressing. I really like those, those balls, the, the heady flavour of saffron, I love it. And I really like your gazpacho sauce as well, that's full of flavour. It's tangy, it's sweet. However, I don't like that with beef. Yeah, me too. It reminds me of star food as a cook. Don't get me wrong, star food in a restaurant's good because it's all got great flavour, uh, but it doesn't necessarily belong together. Yeah. Now that I step back and I think about it, you don't get a beef paella. I probably should have tried to be a bit braver and picked something out the fish box. That would have gone a bit better with it. Tony has made braised rabbit ravioli and is serving it with breaded liver, deep fried beetroot tops, and a red wine sauce. Well made dish, Tony. Really well made dish. The ravioli themselves, lovely and thin, the filling rich with the rabbit, livers on top, great. A more sympathetic sauce, and I'd have been jumping up and down now, going, wow, wow, wow. I find the sauce too strong. However, lovely ravioli, really good livers, and I love the leaves with the parmesan. I really do. Good, thank you. I absolutely loved that challenge. I did an invention test and it didn't go horribly wrong. So a bit more confidence and, uh, and I'm having fun, so let's just bring it on. Simon has used the pumpkin and bone marrow to make gnocchi served in an arabiata sauce and topped with pan-fried cod cheeks, scallop roe and crispy salmon skin. A really creative, really interesting use of all the ingredients you had. The sauce is great. It's got spice, it's got smokiness of bacon. And that whole thing wrapped together with those little dumplings means you've got something which is actually quite unctuous and really quite delicious. I think it's a really good dish, Simon. The cod's cheeks and the scallops are really well cooked. One's sweet, one's meatier, wrapped up with that lovely sauce. Mate, that's great. Thank you. To say that we've got scraps in like a short period of time to, to get a dish together, I'm, I'm happy with what I've got. Yeah, really pleased. Beth has used the rabbit scraps and chicken livers to make a pie and served it with honey and fennel roast squash, a cauliflower puree, pickled beetroot tops and a red wine sauce. Your pastry is lovely and buttery. Your meat inside the pie itself is really nicely cooked. But you can see inside that pie there's not enough moisture. Mm. It's just hunks of meat with some pastry. It's just a bit too dry. Yeah. It's OK. It's not going to set the world on fire. And what goes with it is a little uninspiring. It's better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, a bit gutted, to be honest. I wasn't happy with it at all when it came out. I, um, I panicked. I didn't use the time well enough and um, I should have executed the pie better because that's the main part of the dish. Paul has cooked beef ribs topped with bone marrow and is serving them with beef fat roasted pumpkin, a roasted red pepper and tomato salsa 
beetroot tops and a red wine sauce. That tomato and pepper sauce has no place on that plate whatsoever because the rest of it is delicious. And I mean properly delicious. Rich, lovely beef, warmed all the way through, the fat melting through the, onto the bone. I like the bit of pumpkin underneath, rich with the lard. It's great. You got soft, melting beef with the bone marrow giving all that beefy flavour on it as well. Your sauce is fruity and rich and red wine. That's nice, Paul. Well done, mate. Thank you. It's got a swag in it, hasn't it? Yeah. Finally, Emma has made a warm roast vegetable salad with Ras Al Hanout topped with deep fried chicken livers, chicken skin crumb, garlic croutons, and a honey and red wine vinegar dressing. There are nice things on that plate. The chicken livers are beautifully cooked, they're pink and they've got crispy outside, I really like that. The sweet dressing I really like as well. My issue is it's a little safe for a semi-final of MasterChef. It's, it's like a salad you've prepared at home. Okay. I think if it sat in the middle of the table over conversation, you'd probably pick all the bits clean because there's nice little bits you want to pick up and eat. But as far as an impressive plate of food goes, I've got to say I'm, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed, Emma. Okay. I knew, looking around at all those other dishes, I looked around and I thought, I'm screwed. I knew it from the outset. I mean, I know I'm always negative, but there were some ambitious plates in that room and mine wasn't one of them, so. Great test for our semi-finalists. We've got to push them, because we're looking for our champion. Uh, and today, there were some great dishes. Some, not so good. The dishes from Emma, Sarah and Beth were nowhere near as good as the others in the room. Sarah can be brilliant, we know, but not consistently. And she struggled today. All the things on the plate were cooked well. It was just, they didn't quite belong together. It obviously wasn't um, amazing feedback, but I feel like I'm improving. So it'd be, it'd be really gutting to go now, because I feel like, you know, I could get better. Beth made us a pie. That pie should have been lovely and gravy rich, and it wasn't. The pastry was, was nicely made, but the whole thing was really dry. I really want to go through, but I feel like um, I've been one of the people who has always had to prove themselves and prove themselves and prove themselves, so I don't know how long I can keep doing that. There were bits around Emma's plate I really liked. Those livers with the onion and the bacon were really, really tasty. But in a room of really good cooks today, it seemed to be a bit dull. John, I think she showed a lack of ambition today, Emma. I always said I'd hold my head high, you know, losing to one of these guys. I definitely would. But I think to go out on a bad dish would be really disappointing. Really disappointing. We have to decide who has more potential, who has the ability out of those three to win the competition. We've had to make a really tough decision here. A really tough decision. The contestant leaving us. Is Beth. I was just one mistake too far and yeah, I'm gutted. I really want to carry on. but I can now stop and be like, you know what, I'm really proud of myself. I want to be more jubilant because I did a really good job today, but I feel like I've survived. You know, I feel like I've been thrown a lifeline. Now I've got to prove everything. 
I didn't think it was affecting me as much as it is, but I felt complete relief just then and also really proud. So yeah, final six is crazy. It's a huge achievement. <laughs> The six semi-finalists are now one step closer to the MasterChef finals. Cooking with scraps pushed their levels of creativity. But tonight they'll be stretched even further when they cook for five of the world's most expert palates. The Super Tasters. These men and women make a living out of their ability to analyze food and drink. One guest even has his taste buds insured for over a million pounds. We actually have our own internal tasting language, which we call a huru, which actually means freedom in Swahili. I think some people are born with a naturally fantastic palate. The difference is how many taste buds or papilla you have on your tongue to fire quickly and to tell you, what am I getting, to give you the information. It's like a tool, you know, you taste, you taste, you taste, and then you fine-tune your palate so you understand what, what, what you put inside your mouth. Our five guests are going to perform an autopsy on every single plate. They are going to want to have every one of their senses enlightened, delighted, indulged. The worst crime they can commit today is for these five super tasters to be bored. Here at Avecchia, a food development kitchen in the city of London, the contestants will need to prepare a six-course tasting menu that pushes the boundaries. They have three hours to create dishes that don't just taste good, but will stimulate the heightened senses of their important dinner guests. Oh, amazing. Sarah and Emma have designed the two main courses. What do we say, team? Our team name, we said Team Lady Ninja because <laughs> we think the boys, after they all had a really good round yesterday, probably feeling a bit, you know, safe. So we're going to sneak up behind them and do really well today. That's what we're telling ourselves. <laughs> team Lady Ninja. <laughs> Their first main is a venison carpaccio with a black pepper, sumac, juniper and thyme crust followed by a cannelloni that they plan to shape as a honeycomb and fill with chicory marmalade and blue cheese foam. Bold flavours from both of you. You've always done bold things. Yep. What do you think you've got to do today to, to sort of surprise our five? It has to be everything. It has to be texture, it has to be smell, yep. it has to be presentation, so it has to appeal to all the senses. We I need think. to show a light touch, really, today. Yeah. We don't want to overbear with any one particular flavour or ingredient. So. Well, that's going to be difficult for you, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, this is probably the biggest challenge for me. But yeah, I think uh, I think we can do this. Good. Paul and Pete have created the two starters: an Asian-inspired dish of langoustine, miso roasted sweet corn, and pickled daikon, designed to create the savoury taste of umami followed by the more classic thyme-smoked breast and crispy stuffed leg of pigeon with pumpkin. Can I say, I think your menu is unbelievable. But good food today, as such, you need much more than that. You've got to really, really appeal. Do you think you've got it? I, th I think we do. We have Pete's hand with the elegant plating for sight. We have a lot of different textures. And particularly with the longestine dish, uh, we have a, a sea mist, which is made from a reduced stock of salt and seaweed, which they can spray into the ear and over the dish. How are you going to serve it, this mist? We have little um, spray bottles. Everyone will have their own spray. So we have a spray bottle that you can <laughs> Yeah! <mist. laughs> yeah! Brilliant! Brilliant! Right, right. And, and hands up who's made a mist before. <laughs> Neither of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But you know, it's, it's, it's about trying new things. You've got to push the boat out. We've got to push, you know, push the Mate, push the envelope, haven't we? You've got to push the boat out. You've just got to make sure it floats when you do it. Yeah. 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 <sighs> Definitely. Fingers and toes, mate. We'll be all right. Tony. So it's about right. Yeah. I, I don't think it can be any thicker than that. Tony and Simon are in charge of the desserts. A chocolate cup 
that they hope will surprise the diners with a coolie, a mousse and handmade truffles all hidden under sugar work. Yeah, look at that. Spot on. And a pear millefeuille with an apple sorbet and pistachio popcorn. Simon, how are you doing, mate? Uh, yeah, we're doing OK. Got off to right? a good start. So how far. are you two working as a, as a, as a team, as a pair? Um, we've got a couple of elements on each dish. Um, I'm mainly focusing on the milfoy at the moment. Tony's the master chocolatier, as it were, so... The last time you cooked with chocolate, it was brilliant. I mean, brilliant. Thank you. Can you do it again? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think we've come up with a really inventive idea of how to present the dish. We've also got some really technical elements with some great flavours in there. Um, and I'm working with Simon, and he's an absolute workhorse, so between us, I think we'll be fine. If he's a workhorse, what are you? I'm the cart. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's dragging me along today. It's an hour in, and the contestants are pushing through their prep and going all out to impress. Cider. I'm just going gonna, gonna to soak the pears in it. Crispy pigeon leg is the thigh part stuffed with leg meat, the liver, and with the chopped heart. Today's about being brave, being bold, pushing the boundaries. Great food's got to taste good. It's got to look good. But it's also got to smell good. It has to be multi-sensory. Our contestants today can afford to be daring. We have given them licence to run wild, John. That's 200 millilitres, one to 200, so I want about 400 millilitres. Sarah and Emma are hoping that a slow gin jelly, blackberry chutney, and some innovative rye bread baskets will do the trick. You know, these are things that <laughs> we haven't really done before, so that's always a challenge. And we obviously had to come up with the menu pretty quickly. So, uh, yeah, this is my serious concentration face. <laughs> but the biggest pressure is on Pete, who's trying to work out how to turn seaweed into a dust. Hey, yeah, Paul. Seaweed smoke, mate. <coughs> How does it look? Pulpy, but I think that'll be fine when it's passed. Rather than extreme flavours, Tony and Simon have created puddings with over 15 different techniques, along with multiple colours and textures. It's quite intricate. There's a lot of individual elements, there's a lot of delicate elements. This caramel twill that I'm going to make in a minute, I mean, if we lose one of them, we lose a dessert. So we've got to be careful. Our super tasters have arrived, and they are a pretty formidable looking bunch. They look like a bunch of university professors. Upstairs, the five guests are using this dinner as a rare opportunity to gain some insight into each other's tasting expertise. Chef Josef Youssef creates multi-sensory dining experiences. So here we have the dish which we call a taste of nature, and the idea is to capture the moment that we're in, the season that we're in. Your perception of food is made up by so much more than just the actual flavours or the textures that you're getting. Hopefully, you'll find that they uh, will work very well together, both in terms of the balance between sweet, sourness, salty and bitter, as well as a kukumi, uh, umami roundness to the flavour. That's delicious. So if you put the nose clip on, take a jelly bean. Professor Barry Smith is the founding director at University of London's Centre for the Study of the Senses. And you'll get some sweetness, maybe some sourness. I've been studying the way we perceive taste for about five or six years. Now take the nose clip off. You get the flavour? Oh. Yeah. What flavour is it now? I've got apple. I've got lemon. We think we taste everything with the tongue and it's not true. We use taste, touch, smell. We're also using our eyes and maybe even our ears to pick up on the flavours that we appreciate in food. Sebastian Michaelis is a master tea blender with taste buds that are insured for one million pounds. What you'll get off this is, as you say, that maltiness which comes from the Assam teas, and it can almost be biscuity. Mm. To become a tea taster, it's a long process. 
you have to taste hundreds and hundreds of teas every day. Uh, and they say it takes about five years to be able to reach the level that you need to be to become a master blender. Uh, I've been doing it for about nine years now. And Isabel Legeron and Sarah Jane Evans are both award-winning masters of wine. The joy of wine tasting is actually, once you know how to taste wine, it stops being that thing you drink in the pub and just knock it back with friends. Having studied wine really heightens the experience. I think we're all coming at it from sort of, you know, slightly different professional angle, you know, judging, dissecting flavours. So yeah, I think it's going to be quite a, an interesting panel, yes. Um, get the pigeon on. Yeah. Um, I think once you've got the pigeon on, then yeah. There's an hour until dinner, and Pete and Paul will be the first to serve up their two untested courses. Once they've roasted off the pigeons, their plan is to add another flavour dimension by smoking them in time. Um, Paul? Yeah. These are going to be too hot, dude. I'll have to do them again. Pete, you look really concerned. Uh, no, it's just, uh, yes, it's gone off. you know, um, just trying to... You can say yes if you want. Um, you are concerned, aren't you? A little bit, a little bit, yeah, yeah. I mean, we want to we wanna put a, a good plate of food on the table. Um, so, yeah, I, we, we just got to get it right, haven't I we? I actually think that when you've got that look on your face, yeah. you work better. OK, bit of fear. Bit of fear, nothing like a bit of fear. <laughs> In the pastry kitchen, Simon is making shortbread, another component of the complex meal feuille. We need to get a little wriggle on, I think, here, Tony, don't we? I'm struggling with time. On the mains, Sarah is also under pressure. We're experimenting <laughs> just to make sure that this cannelloni idea isn't completely mad <laughs> and it will work. Um, so far, so good. We'll see. If all goes to plan, this honeycomb cannelloni will be served with their also untried blue cheese foam. Right, there is something that is really scaring me. Tell me about blue cheese and honeycomb. <laughs> so the honeycomb is purely presentation. It's going to look like honeycomb. There's no <laughs> There's honeycomb. No honeycomb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's just the fun, yeah. yeah. And I definitely think both of these dishes are quite fun. There's definitely bits and pieces on them which um, are hopefully going to get a smile out of our very serious diners. Do you know you've got masters of wine up there and you've got people whose taste buds are insured? A lot of pressure. Fortune favours the brave. Thank you. <sighs> Tony is finishing filling the chocolate cups but he still needs to make three different chocolates to top them and the sugar cages. A lot to do. Head down the whole time. Yeah, um, but we should be all right. We should do it. Meanwhile, Simon is having his own problems with the tricky caramel twills. You've got to be uh, thin and delicate, see-through, uh, but good to eat as well, and in one piece, not like that. I'm going to be out for watching these now, because we can't lose them. That's fine. Cross everything. Ta-da! Oh, wicked. Wow. Worked, yeah. That's amazing. A bit uneven at the bottom, but we can okay. ring it. And then I'm going to cut off the end so it's even and then cut it into, like, threes and then we can arrange it in the honeycomb okay. shape. Brilliant. You're first up, right? Yes. You've got 25 minutes to go. Yes. How are you doing? Uh, we're going to... It's, it's pushed, but uh, we should get it out. Pete, how are the pigeons looking? Yeah, they're looking good, mate. Good. You're struggling, aren't you? We've got, we got a fair bit, you know, just to finish off. So, um, yeah, we just need to concentrate and, and, and crack on. Maybe. Oh, it doesn't look that comfy over here, I have it's to not say. that comfy. I can't get... We're going to have to move on a little bit. Where are yeah. we? How are we doing? How are we feeling? We're pushed. 
We are pissed. Yeah, we are. What's the attitude now that's going to get you through? Um, just pretend that we're back in that MasterChef kitchen and, you know, you're standing over us and saying faster, faster, faster. We are in a kitchen. Yep. I am overlooking you and I am shouting faster, faster, faster. <laughs> All three teams have pushed themselves. They've all been really, really ambitious. I'm worried now, maybe a little over ambitious. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to very quickly, on a low heat, put the leaks on. There's about 20 minutes to go, and Pete and Paul do not look ready. Not at all. Um... Emma and Sarah look stressed. I'm scared of going in the pudding room. What am I going to find in there? You're right, mate. I'm in a nightmare with that caramel. I just put too much on that time because I've, I've gone the entire opposite way of what we were when we f the first one. So it's, di it's difficult, but I'm learning. Third time lucky, I think, is going to be key. These men and women act as the senses of the food and drink industry with their exceptional palates and insight dictating levels of quality around the world. Well, for me, it looks like a quite ambitious menu, actually, um, because there's a, so many different aromas to play with. Because you have so many ingredients, I think the challenge will be finding the right balance in the flavours. There are many, many times in which somebody is trying to add something to give a little bit of contrast or difference or to pique our interest. Let's see if it works. How you doing, boys? Yeah, uh, pressure's on. Um, we're a little bit behind. Do you feel like you're out of control? No, uh, no not no. out of control. A little out of time, not out of control. OK. What's the first plate up? It's the longest thing. Right. Come on, then. Let's go. Langustin is quite a delicate flavour, and you've got that sweetness that you really don't want to lose, and you've got something like miso in there, which can be quite strong and overpowering when you put it with any dish. Yeah, for me, it just looks like a lot of, a lot of ingredients. Mm. So it's going to be interesting how those well, how they bring blend together, together yeah. and how they, they work. And what is sea mist? Very hard to know what that is. Mm. No, it's very intriguing. You've got three minutes. What goes on after the longest thing? Uh, the uh, sweet corn, miso sweet corn. Now what goes on? Daikon. Yeah. Where's the daikon? Uh, daikon is... Stand where it's gone. See, what you usually do is put it just look in the fridge. Oh, in the f right, let's go, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, the dish is butter poached longestine tails with a corn puree, longestine bisque, pickled daikon radish charred corn with miso butter and sashimi popcorn. Um, and we have a spray bottle with seaweed steeped water in it. So if you just spray that over the dish to season it, I hope you enjoy it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is exciting. Do you know how much we need to spray on? Go easy on Go it. easy and, yeah, work your way out. It's much more uh, mm. aromatic than any sea mist I've ever Something encountered. a little, something a little nippy and, yeah. and sour in there. But you do yeah. get like you know when the lo the tide is going out, and then you get the all the algae and yeah, I think it's a very interesting idea. Langoustine is like the most. It's a jewel to start a, me a mm. meal with at mm. the beginning, but actually it's just flabby. Mm. I think it was overcooked basically. Well, I can see why the popcorn is there, because the rest of the dish is very soft, but it doesn't blend in. I don't feel it integrates with the dish. I find that the dish has a lot of base notes. You know, it's, everything is quite sweet and monotone. Uh, the only thing that lifts it a little bit is, is the daikon, but even that is completely vinegar. I actually quite liked the way that the daikon cut through the butteriness of the sauce. Um, I did think that worked, but uh, overall, it has a lot of interesting flavours. But doesn't nothing jumps out at you? It doesn't it really doesn't really hit you. Uh, you got 15 minutes for next for the next course, guys. Sure. Are they going in the oven, Pete? Uh, 
They weren't going to, but I think they're going to need to just for five minutes. Yeah. Pete and Paul must now deliver their pigeon and pumpkin combination without fault if they want to win over the diners. This is the simplest dish we have on our mm. menu. And so I think what we're looking for there is to see how good the execution is. I love quite rare pigeon. Um, so for me, that's just coming from my French background. So. <laughs> but my expectation would be to, to have something which is perfectly cooked. Um, and I, I also love the idea of a you know, stuffed leg, leg of pigeon. I mean, you know, pigeon is so tiny. It'd be interesting to see what's the interpretation of that. Are you all right with those pigeons like that? No. No? Oh, let's go back in. Because that pigeon, if you don't hold that down, it's going to fly out this kitchen. Pigeon on top. Oh, look at them nice little drumsticks. I love the look of this plate. I wish it was on time, but I do love the look of the plate. Uh, sorry about the, uh, the wait again, guys. What we have for the second plate is a time-smoked pigeon breast with a stuffed pigeon leg, stuffed with the heart and the liver, with butter, wilted cabbage, a onion marmalade, and a juniper and thyme sauce on pumpkin puree. Mm, thank you. It's very aromatic. It does smell very nice. Mm. Yeah. It, it, yeah. The aromas, the, the aromas are, yeah, yeah. are really aromas are great good. that are coming off. And there's a lot of, of aromas coming yeah, up. Which is always, yeah. you know, yeah. great. Some would think that this plate is uh, too bright and too colourful. Actually, I rather like that. The orange of the leg, the pumpkin, the, the red of the blood, the green of the cabbage, it's all happening. You know, there's lots of interesting work gone into this. Mm -hmm. The um, stuffed crisp leg, leg of pigeon is incredibly tasty. With the pigeon, the breast, I thought that it was uh, maybe a little underdone. I disagree with that. I thought that the pigeon breast, for, for my taste, was cooked perfectly. No, I think there's a lot of good thought that went in in terms of balancing mm. flavours. You have the sweetness, you have the meatiness, you have you know, the saltiness, you have lots of nice textures in there as well. The only one thing that I think is missing is that juniper. It could have just been a bit more pronounced. <sighs> oh, God. After all that work with that longestine dish, it's actually unspectacular. I totally agree. However, the pigeon dish is great. Um, pretty happy with what we turned out. Um, it was just, it was just tough, you know. Uh, it sort of crept up on us at the end, um, and things got a bit rushed. But I think we put out two decent plates of food. Perhaps maybe one more element off the plate, and we could have managed it much better. But if you don't push yourselves at the semi-final stage, you're never going to be seen as someone who shines and is worthy of going forward in the competition. You're 15 minutes, ladies. 15 minutes. Uh, cracker baskets, except they didn't work, so we're just going to do individual crackers. I mean, it might be better, actually, because um, they'd be a bit daintier. Um, I'm going to bring them over to Emma now. I do like venison. I think venison's very good. But this is carpaccio, so we're actually dealing with venison in a slightly different way. I like the fact that with venison, we've also got slow gin mm -hmm. jelly, so we're talking was, about English flavours in here. I was slightly concerned about that, though, because we have a slow gin chutney and we have a slow gin jelly, so we just have to really think very carefully about how that's going to work. What's the... Uh, what's the... Oh, it's the cracker. There's a cracker in the middle, is it? Yeah. yeah. Come on, ladies, do it. Yep. For the boys to shame. You are making a decent fist of presentation, yeah? Tim, go. Well done. We have done a venison carpaccio, which has been crusted with thyme, black pepper, sumac, and juniper. 
It's served with a rye cracker, some pecorino, a slow gin and thyme and juniper jelly, and a blackberry chutney with some more slow gin in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To say something about the presentation, all the studies that we've done have shown that people prefer to have an odd number of things on their plate and not an even. And here we've got three, that's good. It's one of the nicest venison carpaccio or any, any carpaccio I've ever had, you know, it sort of literally melts in your mouth. Mm. The slow gin chutney added a really nice kind of sweetness to the dish. And that biscuit, it's a great contrast. Mm. I, I did look at it and think, oh he heavens, this looks like a really heavy biscuit, but mm. it, was, it was just exactly right. I agree that I thought the meat was beautifully done, but I did find that I lost the flavour a little bit because of that pepper. The pepper is quite dominant, but of course pepper is a different system, it's not taste buds, but uh, mm. trigeminal nerve endings and so it leaves everything else intact. You still get the flavours coming through, it's just that your attention is grabbed by the pepper. So I think this is a well-balanced dish, the cracker look good. A little bit of restraint on the pepper, but otherwise, very good dish. Where's that paper towel? 15 minutes, next course goes out, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Emma, I'm going to wash and prepare the chicory and get the yeah. bacon on. OK. okay. Uh, I'm going to put the beignets on. There is a little bit more to do. Yeah, the beignets, um, we've got to fry off the pancetta, the blue cheese foam as well. I can't believe, as always, when you have these tasks, where the time goes. It's crazy, it really is. The slightly paradoxical description, honeycomb cannelloni. How do you bring soft and hard together? Mm. There should be some very interesting uh, textures. I'm expecting with chicory being quite crisp and the blue cheese should be quite smooth and creamy in a way. Right, Emma, bacon's done. Cool. I mean, it's a very daring dish because there's a lot of bitterness, a lot of strong flavours. So my, my thing would be, is it how overpowering should is that dish delicious. going to be? We need to put a little bit of the marmalade All inside right. the middle of each tube. OK. I love this. I absolutely love this. Right. OK. I'll pass that to me. You foam. I'm scared. OK. I'm really scared. It's OK. Right. Emma, have you used one of these foam things before? No, never. No, neither of us have. Right, I'm going to go and stand over here. OK. Whoa! Whoa. Go on. Go on. Yeah, yeah go, hey. go, 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 go. Is go. that what you wanted? Yeah. Good. Brilliant. Beautiful. Let's go, let's go, let's go. You've got it. Stop fiddling with it. Okay. So you've got a cannellini that's designed to look like honeycomb. There's a chicory marmalade, uh, a blue cheese foam, blue cheese beignets, and some pancetta. Enjoy. Lovely, thank you. Well done. Oh, well done as well. We did it. Yeah, we did do it. Foam. We did foam. Well done. <laughs> It's very, very nicely visually mm. presented. Plus, it smells wonderful. Yes. Mm. Actually, as the mm. plate was travelling, there's a lot of stuff in there that you just want to mm. check yeah. into. We're seeing a bit of symmetry here again, like with the last dish, but I think it works a little bit better here. Mine is just off symmetrical, so I'm happier with it. So, so when you're at home, do you worry about the symmetry of the dishes that you serve? Absolutely. Do you? Oh my gosh, OK. <laughs> Remind me never to invite you to mine. <laughs> I think the people cooking this have got very good palates because I think the balance is very, very mm. good. You do definitely have the sweet, the sour, the salty, the bitter, the umami, especially with the pancetta, and you know, it, I think it balances out very nicely. I think the best is the cannelloni. I just love what's inside. They're very, very sympathetic cooks, and I think that these two dishes, mm. one after another, are just great. It's, it's lovely. Overall, I'm impressed with the ladies. I'm impressed with their invention and the workload they took on and how they work together. I think they've done very well. What we've got are two very interesting dishes and two dishes I didn't expect. Really happy with how the plates looked, really happy. I had a bad round um, and I think that really motivates you to push yourself a bit further. You know, things I've done today are things I've 
never done before and it's, it's a good feeling to know that you've done it and it, hopefully it's worked. We managed to do it and we weren't too over I don't think so I'm glad we were ambitious and we pushed ourselves. We're not here for an easy life I guess. Right, how are we doing boys? We're up against it with the caramel twills at the minute. They're looking better. Hey! Good, good. Simon and Tony's multi-layered pear meal fouille will be the first dessert. Seven different elements that need to be brought together in a perfectly balanced dish. The, the desserts sound, sound on paper a little bit less exciting, but I think possibly in the eating they, they could be delicious. It's quite difficult to imagine how strong a flavour they can get out of the, the popcorn, especially with pistachio, which is quite subtle. Pistachio dust, so it should make them nice and uh, sweet and pistachio <laughs> I'll be curious to see if it does work or if we can cut through the, uh, the acidic apple. Mm. It seems it works, so, yeah, it's good. Gamble paid off. Right. You guys can start to play. Look at that. Looks great, guys. What did you call it early? Popcorn yeah. and bouche. <laughs> Superb. And on time. What a triumph. So proud of you two. Go on, boys. Knock them dead. The pear mill fui is made up of layers of shortbread, caramel pear balls and blackcurrant pear balls, topped with a caramel tweel and pistachio popcorn, served with apple sorbet and a dried apple ring. I think this looks beautiful. I can see there's something going to be crispy and caramelly here. It's going to make a noise when I eat it. I think the whole, whole thing about it gets me excited. I think it's lovely. Mm -hmm. I think what, what's good about it is the surprise because you're getting no clue from the colours as to whether you're going to get apple or pear. So that's a little bit playful and by dessert I think you want that. And the caramel I think is uh, beautiful. That's, it's actually my, I mean I've got a bit of a sweet twist but um, that uh, very thin layer is really easy to eat and it crumbles just right. I think one thing we have to bear in mind is on a culinary kind of technical level I think they've executed each of the mm -hmm. elements well and I think it's mm. led to a nice texture very nicely presented. I mean, they've done something really nice with this. Determined to finish the meal on a high, Tony and Simon need to top their chocolate cup with its surprises done. and make the sugar cages. That looks quite messy, I think, the chocolate cups. Because yeah, yeah. you like milk chocolate. Dark chocolate, rum mousse, honeycomb, white chocolate, raspberry. Are they going to combine or is one of them going mm. to dominate? I, I, I live in hope. Lovely. Come on, let's have you. Thank you. Whoa! Yeah. Look at that. You can see who the master chocolatier is. Lovely. I tell you what, boys, you've shown a serious amount of artistry here today. Will you stop shaking? I'm pretty nervous. Let's go. Oh, Hello again. Hello. Hi. Thank, Thank you very you. much. For your last course, you have a uh, milk chocolate cup with a dark chocolate and rum mousse, some chocolate truffles, and some sugar work. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy with that? Yeah. yeah. Really good, really good. I would say the first thing that strikes me is you just want to crack in there and see oh, what's kind of yes. hidden away inside. It is very appetizing. It's like a secret casket, no? Mm. That you're going to break into? Beautifully presented, and I think I'm very glad they put raspberries with it. The raspberries really make a difference, especially the ones you discover at the bottom. 
The best thing about this was the truffle. It's bitter, you get the rum coming through, um, and that was really good. But the mousse was just a bit too heavy, and I've left half of it here because I can't quite stomach that much chocolate. You're right, it's quite hard to get all the way through this, but uh, certainly it shows some very nice techniques. Mmm, oh yeah. Well made, lots of skill. Lots of stuff going on. Baskets, mousses, sugar work, truffles. Good. That is my pick of the dishes today. It's quite daunting because I'll eat anything if you warm it up. And I think everything tastes good. Um, but I'm not a super taster. It's an exceptional challenge and it really does heighten your awareness of how things need to taste. Hopefully we've, we've ticked all the boxes and in a good way and they'll like them. Very ambitious effort from our contestants, I have to say. Love the endeavour, appreciate all the hard work. Today was a good day. They really, really pushed themselves. I think they came out trumps. Thank you all for that menu. It's great to see the kind of thought and idea and technique that went into a lot of the dishes. I think we all, as a whole, thought each of the dishes had something that really stood out about it. The thing that matters most to me is flavour. The final thing you stay with after a wonderful course, and you've given us some excellent flavours today. I don't know how you guys do it, especially under the pressure I'm sure you're, you have in there. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a really good day, so I feel a bit more confident about uh, where I stand in the great scheme of things, which is good. I think today has just proved that you don't get any rest now, the pressure just continues to increase. And, you know, I'd really like to go home tonight and have a glass of wine and just relax, but I'm going to have to go and practice, I think. I'm looking forward to the next challenge. Probably really like to go and do it now because I've just had such a good time in there. You can get straight into it and go again, so, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Next time, it's the last of the semi-finals. The critics are back. Awesome shaking. And the remaining six throw everything they've got. Ugh. A disaster. Into securing a place in the MasterChef finals. Drag me away from here. I worry about this a lot. It's gorgeous.